All right, let's talk builds. I'm gonna go through the cards that are available as you level up. But first, I wanna go through the different build paths open to you as a Bone Shaper. There are three main builds uh, that the community has sort of settled on for this class. Uh, and it's helpful to talk through those first before we start getting into the nitty gritty on which cards to choose as you level up because those are really gonna determine which card you wanna pick. Hi YouTube, Jeremy here from the far future. Uh, you can probably tell that by the fact that the rest of this video was shot in our old studio. I've been meaning to circle back to this for a long time. Uh, we got distracted by things like convention season, testing our own games, getting them ready to show to publishers, all that kind of fun stuff. But I've always meant to circle back. A lot has happened in the intervening time though, so I wanted to hop on here before past Jeremy keeps talking, that guy won't shut up, and uh, just fill you in a little bit on some things that I've learned since I first recorded this. So since I first recorded this, I've played this character, the Bone Shaper, to retirement. I'm on a completely new character now. Uh, an unlockable character, one uh, that I'm going to also be loading up a guide video for on here soon, but I had a lot more experience with that character, with the, with the Bone Shaper character, in between the time that I recorded that first video and this one. I do want to start with a big shout out to Reddit user Gripeaway, uh, whose guide I based a, most of the information on this video on. Uh, I used uh, his guide when I was building my own character out to begin with. Uh, it was basically the only one out there at the time. Uh, uh, the game was so new, there just wasn't a ton of information out there that you could find. And uh, I found his stuff really helpful and useful, so I thought throwing it on a video here would, would be something that folks might appreciate, uh, in case that's how they prefer to consume content, you know? Um, if you do want to read his original, I'm going to include a link to it in the description here. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's very thorough and thought out. Uh, it's great. Um, please go check it out uh, and give him props. I really enjoyed playing this character. Um, it was a lot of fun and uh, I hope you guys uh, find some use out of this video. Uh, so with that, uh, back to past Jeremy. See you. So as I said, there are three main build strategies available to the Bone Shaper. The Single Summon build, the Skeleton Swarm build, and the Bone Wall build. Um, they all basically do what they say on the tin. The Single Summon build is pretty straightforward. As you level up, you're going to get access to some more powerful summon cards. Uh, these are going to be lost summons, so you want to be more careful with them than with your skeletons and obviously this means you're going to priori prioritize some cards that are going to help you both heal and keep that summon alive because that is your primary focus as part of this build. The second build available to you is the Skeleton Swarm build. This is the most standard of all the Bone Shaper builds. It does exactly what it sounds like. It's going to focus on letting you summon as many skeletons as possible and get them out on the field in order to deal damage. In this build, you're also going to be focused on trying to keep those skeletons alive for the most part so that they can stay up and deal damage. This is going to be the best damage dealing build available to you. But because of the way it works, it also means that it plays really well with a tank. Um, someone who can take some of the pressure off your summons and allow them to stay alive for longer and maximize their damage output. The Bone Wall build, on the other hand, is an inverse of this. It also focuses on getting lots of skeletons out, but in this case, you are substituting in for the tank. You want your skeletons up front and you want them taking hits 
because you're going to be taking cards that will allow you and the party to benefit from your skeletons taking those hits. You're much less focused on keeping them alive and much more focused on creating a wall of bone that enemies are going to hurt themselves as they try to get through. The first thing to note here is that only the Skeleton Swarm build is really available to you from the start. The Single Summon build will become viable at level 2 when you get your first really good loss summon. And the Bone Wall build will become available to you at level 3 when you get your first card that's going to allow you to benefit from your Skeletons taking hits. We'll get to those as we go through the levels, and in fact, we should probably start now. Okay, level two, your first level up and your first big choice. At level two, you have to choose from Unearthed Horror and Bone Dagger. Unearthed Horror is going to give you access to your first big, powerful loss summon, the Raging Corpse. This guy has six health, two movement, and does a base of three damage. He also puts a leaf on the board when you summon him. This guy is obviously a pretty big step up from your skeletons and your wraith up to this point, and you should obviously take Unearthed Horror if you are going to go for the single summon build. It's got a nice late initiative at 94 to make sure that your, that your Raging Corpse gets summoned after the enemies go, and so again, is less likely to immediately take a hit. Very important for the single summon build. The bottom half of the card grants one of your summons a poison to all adjacent enemies. This can also be really good uh, later on as part of a single summon build. It can be triggered on one of your more powerful summons that you'll eventually replace Raging Corpse with. Skeleton Swarm builds or Bone Wall builds, on the other hand, should look at Bone Dagger. The top half of this card is a 4 damage attack with a curse, plus a bonus damage for each of your summons. It also puts a dark element on the board. It's got a really nice speedy initiative of 29. It's really worth taking the card just to have another fairly quick initiative card alone. The bottom half is where this card really shines. Uh, it gives you a curse at a range of 2, which can be extended by consuming a darkness element. Plus, if a target dies this round, you're able to pull one of your summons back out of the discard pile and immediately summon it, reducing the amount of damage you suffer by two. This is another great way to get a skeleton back out of your discard and back onto the board. Much like Malicious Conversion, although with this one, you don't have to be next to the enemy to trigger it. So this card is going to come in handy for those builds where you need to get skeletons out and resummon them frequently. At level three, the Bone Wall build is going to become viable for the first time. And that's really going to determine which one of these cards you want to look at for your level up. To begin with, you've got Grave Digging. The top half of this is a summon skeleton card, just like the ones we're used to, except this one only deals one damage to yourself when you summon it. This seems like a minor thing, but over the course of a scenario, having a skeleton that deals one less damage every time you summon it can really add up. It's a really, really excellent card to have almost no matter what build you're using. It's got a nice late 96 initiative, again, ensuring that you get summoned after everyone else goes. The bottom half lets you play a card from your discard pile to perform a summon action of the card, dealing one damage to yourself. Again, another way for you to get one of those skeletons out of your discard pile back out to the field. This is a great card. Uh, level 3 is a really tough choice for the Bone Shaper. You have two pretty amazing cards to choose from here. And frankly, if it weren't for the Bone Wall build, I would suggest every build take Grave Digging. And in fact, I'm going to suggest the other two builds, Single Summon and Skeleton Swarm, both take Grave Digging just because it's that good. But let's look at our challenger here, Putrid Cloud. The top card lets you designate one of your summons and perform uh, basically an exploding cloud of poison. It deals two damage to all adjacent enemies, poisoning them, and you kill the summon, 
and put a leaf on the board. It's a non-loss, which is great. And in a lot of cases, it may be worth it to lose a skeleton to deal what could amount to quite a bit of damage. The card has a really, again, nice, speedy 28 initiative. You don't have a lot of low initiative cards, so this is another great one to have in your toolbox to get out and work quickly. But what we're really looking at here is the bottom half of this card. This is the ability that makes the bone wall build possible. Whenever an enemy attacks you or one of your summons, that enemy gains poison. If the enemy already has poison, the enemy suffers one damage after the attack instead. So this is what makes the bone wall build sing. The way that this build works, you're going to get, as I said, as many skeletons out up close next to the enemy as quickly as possible and then get putrid cloud up. Once putrid cloud is up, every enemy that attacks those skeletons is going to get poisoned. And that's going to both help your skeletons do extra damage to them and your party do extra damage to them. You're basically going to be a poisoning machine with this. It can help you burn through shields. It can help you get enemies down faster. It, it really does help you work well as a substitute tank. So obviously, if you're going for the bone wall build, you're going to want to take Putrid Cloud. It's, it's honestly a fairly straightforward choice here, even though they're both great cards and both tempting. Grave Digging for the other two builds, Putrid Cloud for Bone Wall. At level four, we have another deceptively difficult choice. To begin with, we've got Critical Failure, which objectively is a great card. The top half is another attack granting ability. You grant one of your summons an attack plus one. If you consume a dark element, you even get to grant two of your summons the attack instead. That's great all on its own. It's got a slow initiative at 95, which does limit the utility a bit. The bottom half is much more situational, but it also can lead to a ton of damage output, especially if you're dealing a lot of curses. When the enemy modifier deck pops up a curse card, it's going to let all of your summons adjacent to the enemy that drew that card attack them. Again, if you've managed to stack that deck with a lot of curse cards, this can result in quite an amount of damage. So critical failure at first looks very tempting. But then there's Flesh Shield. Flesh Shield is a, one of just the best cards you can have for all three of our builds. If we look at the top half, you're granting one ally within range three, both shield and retaliate, both of which can be boosted with your two most common elements, leaf and darkness. And it's got the f an even faster initiative than our former fastest initiative card at 16. This thing is going to let you buff your either your allies or your summons really quickly. It's going to make everyone more survivable. That top action is just stellar. The bottom half is uh, almost a panic ability. This can really come in handy uh, if you need to save a summon in a bad situation. That's, less, that's obviously less likely to happen with both Skeleton Swarm and Bone Wall. But especially if you are a single summon build, this can, can be really important. You are going to be chewing through less of your health to summon multiple skeletons out on the board. So you'll have a bigger reserve of HP to use for things like this. And again, it's really a priority for you to keep that single summon alive. So the bottom half of this card can be really, really clutch for that single summon build. Again, paired with the top half, which is can also really be useful for that build. It really just comes in handy for all of them. So the choice here actually may seem difficult at first, but I would recommend anyone take Flesh Shield at level four. All right, so I'm gonna take a minute here in the middle of this video to kind of swerve here and talk about the Frosthaven Helper app from the folks over at Lucky Duck. It's no secret that when this app first came out, there were some issues with it. A lot of that seems to have been smoothed out over time, 
the last several weeks that we've been using it as part of our campaign, I'd say the last three or four scenarios, it's worked pretty well. It's been fairly solid. I haven't seen a lot of crashing or big weird errors or some of the other stuff I saw early on with it. So at this point, I'd say it's a fairly solid choice if you want to reduce some of the upkeep on yourself during the scenarios. A couple of things it doesn't have that I wish it did are ways for keeping track uh, of your character and the campaign itself. These are things that existed in the old Gloomhaven apps that used to exist, and I expect that at some point they'll exist in the apps that are available for Frosthaven as well. And uh, as soon as those do exist, I will probably download them and use them. Until then, I have hacked together a bit of a solution that we're using. I have basically taken the campaign tracker and the individual character trackers for all six of the starter classes and made them interactive fillable PDFs. So you can go in there, do everything that you could on the physical uh, printed out paper sheet version of these, but it's just a little bit easier to go in and retype in numbers and mark things off, uh, especially all of the erasing that you have to do on things like the the soldier tracker as part of the, the campaign sheet. This just makes things a little bit easier there. Um, and the great thing is, uh, these are available for you to download if you want uh, from our website at elevation.games. If this is something you're interested in, if you want to support the work we're doing here, or just stay notified about our own upcoming games, uh, this is a great way to do it. Go over to elevationgames.com, sign up for our newsletter, and you can get immediate access to all of those interactive PDFs. Additionally, we've got lots of other player aids that we've developed over time, some for Arkham Horror, some for Spirit Island. Um, there's, there's a bunch over there, and as soon as you sign up for the newsletter, you can get access to all of them. You can also get access to some of our in-development games, like a print-and-play version of Heisenberger, our upcoming uh, competitive card game for two to four players. That's going to be coming to Kickstarter hopefully sometime later this year. So there's lots of free goodies over there that you can get access to if you're interested. As I said, just head over to elevation.games and check it out. Okay, we're halfway there now. At level five, things are split pretty evenly. It's going to be pretty self-evident which of these cards you want to take based on which build you're using. First of all, we've got Unforgivable Methods. This is going to give us our next big Lost Summon, and it's a doozy, the Stitched Atrocity. He's got eight health, two movement, three attack, and he wounds. He's a big bruiser, and at this point you want to replace Raging Corpse with this guy as your single summon. The bottom half is a really decent heal that can help heal you, your allies, or your summons. But to be honest, you're not likely to use it very often because you're almost always going to have the Stitched Atrocity out instead. Obviously, if you are the single summon build, you're going to take Unforgivable Methods. The other two builds are also very obviously going to want Solid Bones. The top half of this card is great. All Shambling Skeletons get plus one health, plus one movement, and one pierce. That just made all of your skeletons that you're keeping on the board all the time that much better. It's got a nice speedy 32 initiative, so again, a decent chance to get it out there and buff those skeletons before the enemies get to go. And the bottom half is another great four movement card. This one also puts a leaf on the board. All around, a really great solid card that you're definitely going to want to pick if you are either the Skeleton Swarm or Bone Wall builds. 
At level 6, again, we're split between single summon and skeleton summoning builds for this one. Our first card is Rotting Multitude. Uh, this guy's real interesting. Instead of summoning a single skeleton, you get to summon two at once. But you're going to deal six damage to yourself in the process. So if you watch my first video in this series, you'll know I said at one point that the bottom half of the level one card, Life and Death, is going to become a lot more tempting at some point. This is that point. Preventing two damage to you every time you summon a skeleton is useful, but usually not worth the trade-off of losing a skeleton summon card for it. But at this point, if it can prevent six damage and give you two skeletons, it becomes a lot more of a utility. But even without that, the ability to get two skeletons out on the board quickly is obviously going to come in clutch for both of your skeleton summoning builds. It's got a middle of the road 66 initiative, but the bottom half is also just great. It's going to allow you to grant one of your summons a move of four. And if you consume a dark element, you're also going to get to move for four. This is a great ability for moving up you and, and your army quickly uh, because they do have a tendency to lag behind. They're not very fast. Our other card option here is Twisted Decree. The top half is another uh, plus one movement and plus one attack granting ability for one of your summons. It's also going to put a dark element on the board, uh, a nice slow initiative, so you've got a decent idea of when you're going to go in the attack order. The bottom half is a fairly straightforward attack with a decent range of four that's going to both poison and curse the enemy that you're attacking. So it might be tempting to take Rotting Multitude even for the single summon ability, uh, it's just that good, but having another attack granting ability for your single summon is just too useful not to take. So I would recommend single summon builds take Twisted Decree at this point. After the huge swings and incredibly useful cards from level 5 and 6, level 7 can seem a little underwhelming. There are solid cards to choose from here though. The first one we're going to look at is Recycled Limbs. This one allows you to play a card from your discard pile to perform a summon action of the card if you consume both a leaf and dark element. Uh, this is going to sound familiar. You've had lots of cards that let you do something similar to this at this point. This one is just adding this ability to a standard movement and attack granting action for all of your summons. That on its own is pretty great, allowing all of your summons to both move and attack plus one in a single turn. It's got a 52 initiative, not great there. The bottom half on the next three deaths of any figure, you get to perform a heal of two on one ally at range three. Again, an uh, another useful healing option here, and it's not a burner. Recycled Limbs is just really useful if you're going for the Skeleton Swarm build. Uh, if that's the build you're going for, that's the one I recommend you take here. It's going to support uh, basically everything you do with that build. The other card on offer here is Soul Claim. The top half is going to potentially let you get out a lot of curse cards into the mon Monster Modifier deck. Uh, on the next three Monster Deaths, if they're within range three of you, you're going to get to shuffle a curse card in there. Uh, it also puts a Dark Element on the board when you play it. It's got a nice speedy initiative of 23, another one of our low initiative cards, so potentially worth taking just for that. The bottom half is interesting. It's also triggered by a monster death, but in this case, it's going to let you immediately play a card from your discard pile. You should know this tune by now. The difference here is that you get to summon that minion acting as if you occupied the hex where the monster died. So this is a really great way to get one of your summons up close and in the fight very quickly. For that reason alone, I'm going to recommend Soul Claim as the card for people going for the Bone Wall build. It's, it just synergizes really well with what you're trying to do, keeping your skeletons up front and center and taking damage. 
Now, things get interesting at this point for the single summon build. I'm actually not going to recommend either of these cards for that build. Instead, I'm going to recommend that you go back and take Rotting Multitude from level 6. It's just a better card than either of your options here. Plus, it's about to come in very useful when we hit level 8, as you're about to see. So here we go, level 8. Uh, this is where the single summon build reaches its ultimate form. And let's start by looking at that ultimate form with endless numbers. This lets you summon the Bone Horde, a big ball of skeletons. I mean, that's literally what it is. This guy has 7 health, 3 movement, and 3 attack. But he's buffable by sacrificing your other skeleton summons into him. So if you look at his ability text here, any of your shambling skeletons are able to end their movement abilities on top of this summon. If they do, they immediately die and you place a token on this card. They get plus one attack for each token placed on this card. So from this point forward, you're basically going to be trying to suicide run your shambling skeletons into your bone ball every scenario to maximize its damage output as quickly as possible. This seems like a lot of upkeep, and it is, but considering how many shambling skeletons you can summon in a single scenario, you can boost this guy's damage up to insane levels. And this is where the single summon build really shines. A nice slow 86 initiative, again, the type of thing you want to see on your summon cards. The bottom half uh, is much less interesting, but still solid. You grant one of your summons a movement, and if you consume a dark element, you get to wound everything else around you. Uh, it's a little underwhelming, honestly, but that's fine because you're never going to use the bottom half of this card. From this point forward, if you are a single summon build, you're going to spend your first turn getting endless numbers on the table and go from there. Obviously, that's the card we suggest single summon builds take for this level. The other card we're looking at here is Welling from Beyond. It's a two damage attack to three targets at range of four. And if you consume a dark element, you get to muddle as well. That's not bad. Um, range of four is solid. You're obviously going to be hanging back behind your summons more than likely, uh, but that's probably far enough for you to reach several targets potentially. Add to that the fact that all targets adjacent to at least one of your summons gain a curse, and this is another great way for you to get a lot of curses on the board quickly. A slow 73 initiative is not bad here. The bottom half of the card is a three movement, plus a heal to one ally at three spaces away, and if you consume a leaf, you can put a ward of that same ally as well. So a very solid bottom half to pick from here too. Again, we're going to be divided into skeleton summoners and, uh, well, at this point, also skeleton summoners, but skeleton summoners who wad everything up into a big ball. Um, if you're not going for the single summon build, I'm going to suggest you take Welling from Beyond. Uh, it's just going to be a lot more situationally useful for you than Endless Numbers would. And now we have come to our final level up at level 9 that sees us get some really and truly ridiculously powerful cards. Let's start with Unholy Prowess. Again, if there was any doubt that the Diablo 2 Necromancer was an inspiration here. We've got a skeleton sorcerer that we can summon. This guy has six HP, three movement, three damage, and three range. He also gives all shambling skeletons plus one health while he's out. Add to that the fact that whenever one of your summons kills an enemy with a ranged attack, which this guy can do, you're going to get to add either a leaf or darkness element to the board. Unholy Prowess is an incredible card. I'm definitely going to suggest you take this for both Bone Wall and Skeleton Swarm builds. 
it just makes those builds do what they already do even better. A nice slow 97 initiative. The bottom half of the card allows you to ignore all damage to self abilities on your ability cards. Plus it puts your two most used elements on the board. Again, for Bone Wall and Skeleton Summon builds, this is just the way to go. Our other available card here is Behold the Shrouded Sun. The top half puts a Bane debuff on the next enemy that kills one of your summons and puts a darkness element on the board. It's got a great level 10 initiative, fastest one you're going to get in the game. The bottom half lets you deal two damage to yourself and all enemies within range five suffer one damage. And this can be buffed by consuming both leaf and dark. Honestly, a single summon build there could be an argument to take either one of these. They're both great. I would probably lean towards the, towards Behold the Shrouded Sun, simply for that super fast Speedy 10 initiative. So that's gonna do it. Um, that is a pretty solid look at all of the build options for the Bone Shaper class for Frosthaven as well as looking at all of the different choices of cards as you level up from two to nine. And if you do enjoy what we're doing here, uh, please be sure to uh, hit the like and subscribe button. Until next time, I've been Jeremy Henderson with Elevation Games. I'll see you later.